Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the California Defense Manufacturing Community Program Support to Sierra Turbines. My name is Ed Hendricks. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, my name is Ed Hendricks, and I will provide a brief overview of NextFlex and the De Defense Manufacturing Community Support Program, um, also known as the Cadence Grant. I will be followed by Dr. Alex Cook, who will be um, who will describe Next NextFlex support to Sierra Turbines under the Cadence Grant, and then I'll be followed by. Uh, then he will be followed by Daniel Life, and uh, who, who, who will be um, discussing uh, a, a brief overview of Sierra Turbines and talking a little more in detail about the support received under the Cadence Grant. Next slide, please. Um, if you could save your questions for the for the end of the uh, of the uh, of the webcast, um, we'll show these. Um, We'll show these instructions again. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, please note that uh, some of the material presented in, on the NextFlex portion is is um, is basically uh, based on research sponsored by the Air Force Research Laboratory under um, two cooperative agreements. The U.S. government is authorized to re re reproduce and distribute. Um, the the reprints of the uh, of the copyright um, material, um, and please note that the views and conclusions contained herein are those of the authors and not um, not of the U.S. government. Um, other contents of this presentation um, that were done under the Cadence program were prepared under the con under contract with Sierra Turbines, and again, um, these uh, views and conclusions. Are, uh, are those of the presenters and should not be interpreted as an endorsement by the government or NASA. Next slide. So next slide, please. So NextFlex is one of 16 manufacturing innovation institutes with the common objective of developing, fostering an advanced manufacturing technology for the benefit of America workers. We're also one of nine manufacturing institutes, chiefly funded by DOD, and so we have the added um, uh, the added benefit to support manufacturing uh, manufacturing ecosystems relevant to the warfighter. Next slide. So just quickly note that NextFlex was founded uh, was established in 2015. Um, we are on our second cooperative agreement, and um, and we uh, will and we are chiefly funded through DoD through um, uh, projects and um, and another support. Next slide, please. So NextFlex has um, several functions, and within this, and we'll go into some detail on the uh, on on one of the functions. Uh, but basically, our main function is to maintain an ecosystem consist of, consisting of universities, DOD agencies, and commercial partnerships. We host webinars and workshops and other networking events such as this one, um, again, with the, with the aim of advancing uh, flexible hybrid electronics technology. They, we also maintain 11 technical working groups, maintaining technical technology roadmaps, and identifying gaps. Next, we also host um, and direct and administer project calls to close these gaps and advance technology. We maintain a technology hub, uh, a technology hub where we contribute to the to FHE learning while supporting DoD projects and commercial um, com commercial projects alike. Um, and lastly, we have a, a uh, a, a nationally recognized workforce development program where we focus on um, introducing uh, young young men and women to uh, STEM uh, careers, um, as well as uh, transitioning vet veterans and um, and other professionals. Um, and 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 again, the focus is on advanced manufacturing technology and specifically hybrid electronics. 
Um, next slide, please. Our membership, um, uh, our membership um, includes a private and public partnership constituting the hybrid electronics ecosystem um, where we include um, OEMs um, and defense contractors, manufacturers, equipment providers, materials and component suppliers, universities and commercial contractors um, from small to very large. Next slide. Hybrid electronics um, have a number of relevant markets and we show them here. Um, and, oh, next slide, I'm sorry. Um, and we show them here, um, including uh, printed uh, antennas supporting RF and communications, um, UAV and satellite and aerospace applications, um, given the attributes of, of hybrid electronics, lightweight, um, work well in this area. Structural health and asset monitoring, which we'll go into a little more detail with the CR Turbines project. Soft robotics, automotive applications, medical devices and wearables. And, and, uh, and that's but a few of the, the, the devices that we support um, within, the, within the consortium. Next slide, please. For the Department of Defense, these um, market um, applications have direct counterparts within, within DOD. And, uh, and, and we, we show here a few of the DOD relevant applications. Next slide, please. So going on to a little bit more detail as, as to what we do here at uh, NextFlex. So at NextFlex, we wanted to um, take um, a recognizable um, uh, PCBA, printed circuit board assembly, and convert it to um, a hybrid electronics device. Um, and what we did is we started out with um, an Arduino mini microcontroller, um, and we did a direct copy onto a flexible substrate using flexible hybrid electronics techniques and technology. The Arduino, Arduino was chosen because it's readily recognizable and and, and, and the, the transition over to a flexible hybrid electronics device would adequately demonstrate all the attributes and capabilities at that particular time. Next slide, please. And what this led to was a basic platform upon which NextFlex could build and support DOD and commercial programs alike. Um, again, starting off with a, a direct copy of, a, of an Arduino, we developed a, a, a flexible microcontroller um, where we can start adding uh, capability to include radio, to include um, uh, uh, wireless, um, uh, wireless uh, connectivity, um, and printed antennas, um, uh, uh, charging, energy harvesting, um, as, as well as um, adding sensor uh, capability for specific uh, projects, um, specific projects to include a confined space monitoring device, as well as um, a NASA AstroSense um, cortisol um, stress detector. Next, next slide, please. We also um, try out new materials within um, within NextFlex, where we will take um, equipment materials or new processes and we'll characterize them and develop um, the best application or, uh, or, or um, showcase where um, which application is best benefited from a particular material um, process or, um, or, or um, assembly or deposition uh, capability. Next slide, please. We have a, a wide variety of, of material deposition capability um, to include screen printing, gravure offset, extrusion printing, inkjet, and aerosol print. I'll highlight the extrusion print and the aerosol print because these are both digital platforms where uh, the operator can um, use a much more iterative process, albeit in an added, a fully additive process, to to, to, um, to make these circuits and print them out. 
Um, the, the extrusion printer uh, of choice that we have is uh, made by the company Inscript, and the aerosol print is an Optimac one, and, and both have their own strengths and weaknesses and applications, and one of which we've demonstrated within the, the, the course of this particular project. We have also other, other techniques um, to include uh, plasma uh, jet printing, which you might have heard about uh, last week when we had our, our Space Foundries uh, webinar. Next slide, please. Also within our facility, we do uh, system integration and, uh, and basically building up uh, equivalent of uh, flexible equivalent or FHE equivalent of, um, of PCBAs. And there we, we, have, we make a, a small um, deviation from your traditional PCBA in that we attach the die directly to the substrate, whether it be uh, rigid or flexible. And, um, and, and further, um, for our flexible applications, we will thin that die to the point that the die is also um, flexible and attach that directly to the substrate using conductive inks. And, um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, if you'd like to have um, a virtual tool tour of the NextFlex Technology Hub, um, you can get onto YouTube and search NextFlex Technology Hub and a number of uh, different uh, views will come up and you'll be able to, um, to have a look at and, and a walk through um, our technology hub um, all within about a year or so. Um, and next slide, please. So next part of this program, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Defense Manufacturing Community Support Program grant. Um, and next slide, please. The Defense Manufacturing Community Support Program is designed to support long-term community investments that strengthen national security innovation and expand the capabilities of the defense industrial base. The Department of Defense awarded six grants totaling $25 million under the Defense Manufacturing Community Support Program um, by the Office of Local Defense Community, community Cooperation. These awards follow a competitive selection process culminating under the Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. In this, uh, in this process, California applied for and gained a uh, defense manufacturing community status and, um, and uh, the, the CADENCE program or the California Advanced Defense Ecosystem and National Consortium effort uh, was awarded of $4.9 million um, uh, to, support, um, to support small businesses, uh, defense contractors in California. Um, under this program, um, under this program, uh, NextFlex was a sub-recipient with the, uh, next slide please, with the, with the goal and objectives to support um, multiple small business recipients by providing services to meet individual company needs. And so I've listed here some examples of the kind of support that we've provided. And in this particular case, um, for CR turbines, we, um, we focused on hardware design and soft uh, hardware design and, um, and, and maybe a conversion to um, an FHE application. Next slide, please. So um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alex Cook, who's an engineering manager at NextFlex, um, and he led the effort of support to Sierra Turbines. Yep. Take it away, Hello. Alex. Yep, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, so as mentioned by Ed, uh, we have uh, Roger and Daniel Life on the line to uh, take the presentation away. Uh, just as a little introduction, uh, of course, Sierra Turbines is developing micro turbine engines uh, for leading engine suppliers with a few key advantages. They're inherently lightweight. They use inher 
additive and digital manufacturing processes. Uh, as you can actually see in the uh, picture attached there, they have uh, reliable control systems and of course are very fuel efficient and have advanced uh, performance characteristics. Uh, go on to the next slide, please. Now, these are some of the tasks that we initially planned on doing. Uh, as with anything, no plan survives contact with the you know, process, but uh, generally what we were looking at doing first was manufacturing these SANS EC structures uh, to form uh, sensors on the turbines themselves. Uh, this was uh, done sort of ex situ initially, uh, so printed on flat substrates. Um, but we did also do a little bit of work uh, very briefly printing on the turbines themselves as a proof of concept. Uh, to make this happen, we were using primarily uh, the extrusion platform on the Inscript. Uh, this is largely because we were interested in the manufacturing and space efforts, um, which uh, primarily are using Inscript as well. Uh, we also looked at a little matrix of uh, different materials uh, in terms of substrates as well as inks. Uh, usually for the substrates, polyamides due to their high temperature resistance uh, since they are going on the side of a turbine. But we looked at a few different uh, NextFlex mem uh, members for ink uh, providers and uh, did some work on uh, understanding what we needed to do to make these print reliably. These are a little bit of an unusual uh, print design for us because it's uh, one long line with uh, zero start stops through the entire one. Uh, so make, maintaining reliability was a large uh, requirement for us, um, but also there were some pretty uh, strict uh, line width and uh, thickness requirements that we had to hit. We also uh, we're looking at the uh, actually testing the antennas. Uh, in situ, you usually want to have a specific RF antenna printed right on top of it. That was a little bit of a reach for the scope, but we did do a little bit of testing in house as well as in collaboration with uh, Sierra Turbines uh, to make that happen. I think with that, we can hand it over to uh, Daniel and Roger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Oop. Can't hear you, Daniel. You on mute? Oh, hey, there we go. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alex, for the intro. Um, so I'd like you to join us on a hero's journey. And it's a little bit like um, Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and a little bit like Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, one difference though, is that we do in fact find the grail and that's, that's a big deal. So let me introduce our hero. He's Dodd. I bet many of you are familiar with Dodd. Um, I think we all know who he is. He's a warrior. He's charged with protecting the people of his land, and he initiated a call to adventure um, via the Cadence Grant. And I'll just, like uh, Alex had said, no journey um, is often a straight path. As you look backwards, you often discover that it probably would have been quick if you would have known all the steps going along the way. Um, but once you reach the goal, uh, that's hindsight, and this is research. So because of the Cadence Grant and Netflix, we had incredible access to technology, um, better than many other large companies are using. And I want to talk about the cast of characters. And of course, you've met the uh, two of our wizards, as well as Roger. So we have three wizards in total. Um, and I also want to introduce the knights. In uh, a couple of cases, the knights happen to be logos, and that's uh, simply because it was a, a team effort. Um, Gyra Systems uh, helped us, uh, Panasonic as well. Um, my colleague David Laudermilk from Sierra Turbines, and one knight joins us uh, posthumously. It's Dr. Woodard of the Langley um, NASA uh, facility. 
And every journey, uh, every hero's journey has to have some form of a quest, something that's being sought. And in this case, it's innovation. And for discussion purposes, we're going to say that the, sh the holy grail that we're looking for is a shield. And we'll break that down a little bit more as we move along. That It could be devices or assets. These are some examples. If we want to get into specific examples, these are a few. Um, this one, for instance, for the Army. A couple of in situ items. A quadcopter or a scale down B2. Could even be a vertical takeoff and landing device. Or it could even be a flight suit. Or how about a turbine powered airship that's unmanned? So Dodd has interest in the leading edges and shells of devices. So basically, Dodd has some interesting uh, features that um, he might be looking to have someone uh, make enhancements to. And um, here's an example of something that kind of bridges that gap between terrestrial and space. And in all of these cases, um, lightweight and temperature capabilities are key. So some of the common materials used for this, super alloys, carbon fiber, and CMCs, or carbon matrix composites. And we're gonna take a little side adventure over to material science. I think it's important to kind of get a little context. So let's say that Dodd's looking for materials for hypersonics or for a re-entry like we just saw. Um, Dodd would have to have some technical requirements and they might be rather demanding. And these, these are some of them. We can go kind of down the list here, but um, you can very quickly see that it has to be materials that can take temperature, they can take stress, um, they need to um, be able to make sure that they are able to be strong and have um, a long-term uh, ability to handle high cycle fatigue. Um, and it's great if they're reusable because Dodd basically uh, is continually looking for uh, things that will um, budget out either at an equal cost or a little bit less than existing solutions. And reusability is a big uh, approach to being able to make that happen. So Dodd might, may or may not be surprised to know that some of his needs at, overlap those of NASA and people that are looking to uh, do things in hypersonics and space. Um, as many of you may know, um, a key NASA innovation goal is commercialization of low Earth orbit. So for about 30 years, NASA has been doing microgravity research. And one of the key topics has been directionally solidified alloys. And there is a lot of conversation about directionally solidified alloys in comparison to um, single crystal uh, super alloys. And we're not going to dive into that. Uh, discussion deeply here. We are going to give a shout out to single crystal. Um, it does have a lot of mechanical, uh, mechanical strength at elevated temperatures and so that's one of the reasons why it's being used and there's a lot of attention on it. A little background on who CR turbines is and how we kind of fit into this material science discussion. Um, we are an industry 4.0 company we leverage additive manufacturing and material science, uh, both on Earth and in space. And we too have an interest in directionally solidified alloys, um, but and also advanced ceramics matrix composites or, or CMCs. And for the last, um, well, since 2018, actually, we've been involved in a NASA phase three SIBR. Um, and that started out through uh, Maiden Space, and they got acquired by Redwire uh, not that long ago. Um, and the whole effort is sponsored by the Johnson Space Center. And this is all focused on commercialization of uh, low Earth orbit, and in this case, the ISS. So just for fun, I thought I would share, uh, hey, you know, uh, if you're going to manufacture something in space, how long does that take? And we get asked that question a fair amount. Um, as a comparison, um, not, not completely out of context with COVID, 
Um, you can manufacture a, a part. We had one uh, that was uh, shipped up and returned to us in 34 days. That's pretty fast. It feels like a long time, but that's about half of what it would take if you were to ship something to China, have it fabricated, um, and returned back to you. That's just half of it. And I didn't even count the production time. And just a little note here, it's, uh, you see a, a couple mentions of some of the trips and the, and the payloads and the launch vehicles that um, picked up and returned uh, on our behalf for the project. Little bit of background or backstory. Uh, these are some of the, the players that helped make one of our trips um, successful. And you also kind of see in the lower right the, the two manufacturing modules that are now on the space station. And our, our hero um, is, uh, is Kate Rubens, who did all of the um, twisting of the knobs and pushing of the buttons and making sure that everything was loaded and working correctly. So um, she is a hero to us. Just want to show a little bit of recent work, a little bit bigger. Alex showed this previously. These are all terrestrially manufactured items. And these are using the materials that Dodd is excited about. We're energized by the results of what we've done in microgravity right now. Um, things look um, pretty promising. We'd like to continue with that. We do get asked the question, why material science in microgravity? And I thought I would let somebody else answer that for a change. Manufacturing in space has at its core the following idea. This extraordinary environment with a completely different set of environmental factors than the Earth can enable you to manufacture things that you couldn't manufacture on Earth that have value. Our economy has historically been a you know a value added economy, right? We take raw material and we turn it into steel and we sell that steel for profit. Finding new ways of making things is historically the makings of economic boom. Three, two, one, zero. Yes, So I want to share one example of what we believe that the future could be like um, due to this materials science research. Um, and that's based upon 30 years of NASA experiments, but also our own um, experiences. So recently, Rolls-Royce um, set a record for what's called time on wing. And for those of you not familiar with that, that's the, the amount of time that a wing will, uh, that an engine will sit on a wing before it's taken off for a major overhaul. Um, and this was done on one of their larger engines, the Trent 700. Um, you can see it's on an Aeroflot plane. Um, and over a period of 11 years, it amassed 50,000 hours. So time on wing by some um, engine manufacturers are there, you know, excited about the fact that it's, it could be up to 30,000 hours. Although in reality, a lot of them, the uh, company's uh, maintenance schedules or plans will use 15,000 hours as their measure. And they try to stick with that. So the use of a super alloy uh, manufactured in microgravity has some unique and we think better material properties that could contribute to a longer time on wing and, and basically comes down to the microstructure um, and the grain. And the idea is that it's able to handle fatigue um, and save time between overhauls. And this is supported by some historical data and from previous flight samples and our analysis of CMC materials. And the result showed, in our case, a 20% increase in micro hardness. And that's different because that's a different level of hardness from uh, manufacturing in space than we were able to achieve terrestrially. So if you think about this, if you have stronger blades, what is the possible gain in service life? Um, what if it were closer instead of 30,000 or 15,000 hours to maybe a decade? And this is the reason why the possibilities um, of what uh, can be done in microgravity are of interest to us. And it's also why it's of interest to Dodd as well. So uh, what about monitoring the structural and operational health of Dodd's shield or his assets? So Dodd's got questions. 
um, a, you know, some of these are just logical, um, you know, queries that you want to know. And, and all of it really comes back to readiness. Is it ready to use? Um, is it nearing the end of its life, for example? And being able to monitor the structural and operational health pretty much anywhere on the globe would be a big deal. And we're showing pictures of an off-road race in which we use um, that uh, venue to test uh, a low Earth orbit, um, or excuse me, a low bandwidth antenna from the folks at Swarm who were recently acquired by SpaceX. And it allowed us to do a proof of concept giving us essentially connectivity um, anywhere on the planet. And these are the kinds of things that line up pretty well with what DOT would like to do too. So, yep, that is why we joined the quest. And essentially it's this great overlap between the opportunity of the sensors being printed in FHE and how it helps DOD as well as how it helps our plat uh, engine platform for the future. So the magic of this quest was to test feasibility of producing sensors that don't have or don't require sensor power. Um, and they have to function in pretty harsh conditions. So there's no circuit or battery in this particular case. And Roger had the vision that we wanted sensors that are lightweight, fault tolerant, multi-sensing, and so forth. And lightweight is a big deal because weight reduction is super key in making things fly longer and faster. So little sidebar here, fun fact, ceramics or CMCs, ceramic matrix composites, weigh about a third of the super alloys that we've mentioned. And they also have some unique um, properties when they're um, exposed to higher temperatures. And the ability to have them take heat uh, basically contributes to greater efficiency overall in the operation of something. So fault tolerant. Well, what are the things that stress things that are moving at high speed? It's pressure, temperature, and there are some environmental issues that come up too. So Roger had the idea, we need to have sensors that are gonna function even if there's a little crack or a fracture. We also needed the sensors to be able to do more than one thing or detect more than one phenomena at a time. And these are some of the uh, items that uh, would be examples of things that we'd wanna sense. So let's say you have a weird vibration uh, when an asset is flying. And when the sensors detect that, the, the, let's say you wanna change the fuel level or the altitude um, just to sort of tune things up. Roger wanted sensors that would have the ability to adapt uh, by being able to be commanded. And that is a big deal to essentially tune an engine in flight, um, especially for uh, smaller uh, turbine engines. So to build a better shield for Dodd, um, we were fortunate to be able to team up with the Knights and Wizards of Nextflex. And here are our wizards again. And our goals, we needed to produce an antenna, a sensor, and to find the path to using a new approach, which is really no small order. And we think this is a big deal because we're not using traditional manufacturing. And a huge benefit is we're able to keep the supply chain in the U.S. And Nextflex has um, uh, knowledge and uh, equipment that allows us to do things that only big companies can do. And, and that is uh, super powerful for us. Um, in fact, they have more know-how and better equipment than a lot of the big guys. And for us, it's also uh, nothing that we're doing is going to get stuck on a boat. And here's a little shot of the end script, which is one of the devices that was used, as Alex mentioned. Now, all of this isn't magic. And I, I wanna talk a little bit about the technology. It's called SANS or SANS EC. Um, and Dr. Woodward, Woodard, um, the inventor, actually calls it uh, SANSIC. I think we've adapted it to SANS EC. That works for all of you. And, um, the SANS is just like what you might be familiar with. You have serif type bases and you, um, you'll you have SANS serif type bases. It just does, knows little tails. 
sans obviously means uh, without uh, in this case. And for sans EC, the without essentially means without electric current. So people ask us, well, there's no electric current. How does it get power? And the answer is a magnetic field response. So essentially the sensors are providing a magnetic field response. Um, they're not powered, but they essentially emit a response when they are energized by an antenna that is asking them questions or interrogating them. And the antenna is located closely enough, but it's protected. Um, and it is uh, connected to a system that we essentially call the interrogation system. And this is sort of the lay it out on the desk, this is what you need to make this happen kind of diagram. Um, there's a, a product from uh, some friends of ours down the road, a couple of them actually, plus a little antenna. And this is all part of being able to interrogate as well as process uh, the massive amount of data that's being produced by the sensors. And here's this is a side view of the sensor, almost in a layer type or edge view uh, diagram. Um, and we could get geeky about this if we want to, but um, the main parts uh, that you're going to see are the, the sensor themselves, which sit on a substrate. Um, there's a protective layer. You'll see that a little bit later. And then there's essentially a measurement device. Um, and um, or excuse me, a measurement sensitive dielectric. A dielectric is um, something that Dodd might use to, um, to hide or protect uh, something so that it's either protected from damage or from heat or stress. Um, it also might be used to make it so that folks can't see what's coming at them. Um, and that's helpful too. And all of that is um, interrogated by the, the antenna and the system that's located somewhere nearby, but protected. So the interrogation system basically asks uh, a series of questions and the sensors do their part by um, responding by uh, indicating changes in resonance. And they can be, those, those sensors can be made, as I mentioned, in you know, multiple layers. It just depends upon what the requirements are. And I'm just, this diagram calls out the fact that you can use a protective layer um, to essentially um, you know, keep the, the sensors um, near what's being measured, but um, you know, not uh, subject to the exact same level of heat, for instance, uh, as other components. If you had this all on the bench and you pulled up an Excel spreadsheet, and you did a chart of your active data, and you applied some sort of change to the sensors, let's say we you know, happen to heat them up, for instance, you'd see the little chart uh, waves that's on the right, those waves would move and change and the amplitude might change. But here you, you basically can see the, um, the um, amplitude, uh, the frequency and the bandwidth kind of all in one little chart. So let's talk about what SANS EC is not. There's a lot of conversation when you talk about flexible health or flexibly uh, printed um, uh, health monitors. Um, Piso is going to come up as a point of conversation. And um, it's not Piso um, because there is no circuit to read the sensors. And piezo, for those of you who may not be familiar, basically an electrical charge gets generated when certain materials are exposed to mechanical stress. Those stresses can be pressure or heat, and it piezo leverages those changes. And piezo is popular. I mean, it's used for thrusters for satellites. It is used for structural health monitoring, as I mentioned, um, and it can be used for you know things like vibration dampening, active vibration dampening. So let's get some context here. Reasons why um, someone might not choose to work with PISO or why an alternative could be helpful is that um, some of the elements to, to make PISO are lead-based. Um, there is a lot of development for, for trying to find good lead-free solutions, um, but there are not necessarily a lot of commercial um, 
uh, or military applied devices yet for that. Um, the max operating temperature does present some limitations. And that was a primary reason why we didn't consider using piezo. And we did do some, uh, also some tests um, for uh, hypervelocity um, and, or excuse me, Dr. Woodard did some tests for hypervelocity at White Sands. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of video footage on that uh, in a, a, an online available uh, video, if you would care to explore more. So where did SANS EC come from? We have to give credit to the Knight, Dr. Stanley Wooder, um, scientist at NASA Langley, very prolific inventor, and um, always working on R&D and advanced dynamics for mission technologies for NASA. In his own words, he says, the cool thing about this system is that we can make sensors that don't need any connections to anything. And we can completely encapsulize, encapsulate them in any electrically non-conductive material so they can be put in lots of different locations and protected from the environment around them. Plus, we can measure different properties uh, using the same sensor. And here's a little video clip uh, from Dr. Woodard, at, actually at NASA Langley. This is a clip from the NASA Langley Research Center, and it's Dr. Woodard. He's having a little fun by keeping a sensor as a bookmark. Right now, he's attaching the sensor to a plastic container that will be filled with water. And he's going to move that container in next to an interrogating antenna. The antenna is connected to a network analyzer. When the antenna interrogates the sensor, it's going to detect changes in resonance. And in this particular case, the resonance that we're looking for is an indication of the fill level of the container. It looks like it's doing a pretty good job of indicating fill level. This is just an example of the sensor in use in a very simple demonstration. There are other clips that will follow this and those will be in the words of Dr. Woodard. Powered with an external harmonic magnetic field, the sensor uses this geometry. The story I'm going to put the longest trace and an electric field between neighboring traces. As the property being sensed changes, the sensor responds frequency, amplitude, or bandwidth changes. This response is interrogated using an external antenna, a single electrical component having no electrical connections. The sensor can be encased in any non-conductive material, providing protection from its environment even caustic and acidic environments. When used with combustible or caustic fuels, a barrier can be used to separate the container and any combustible fuel vapors from any measurement system electronics. <laughs> Many launch vehicles use liquid fuel. The sloshing motion affects the rocket's attitude. Baffles are used to control the sloshing, but they add weight. At NASA Langley Research Center, we're using an array of four sensitive sensors to measure real-time fluid slosh to determine if a fuel tank's internal structural ice grade can be used to replace some of the baffle's surface, thus reducing the overall baffle weight. Using the sensors placed external to a scale liquid oxygen tank, we have easily taken unobtrusive real-time measurements of the fluid asymmetric and rotational motion, giving us a better understanding of the effect that the ice grids have on fluid motion. So I just want to share why 
um, it's possible that some of our colleagues who are predominantly focused on um, using PZT or, or PISO might have maybe missed um, SANS EC, and, and we think it basically is an equipment issue. So this all began back in 2018. Roger uh, attended a CAS event. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with CAS, it's NASA's Convergent Aeronautics Solutions um, event. And these are the areas of topics that they have their uh, focus in. And essentially, uh, because of CAS, we were able to um, leverage a technology transfer um, and be able to use the net the um, SANS EC technology with the help of NextFlex. So Dodd could use flexible hybrid SANS EC sensors to monitor structural and operational health of assets. But there are other people that are interested in that as well. And a couple of the applications for um, uh, others would include, uh, if you see the habitat item kind of in the back, uh, with the person floating in front of it, that's an inflatable habitat. And that particular habitat's moving at orbital speeds. Um, not gonna get into how many Mach that is, it's a lot. Um, and there are little objects that um, are in space that float around and hit things. Um, and so damage, um, being able to detect the damage from orbital velocity uh, objects um, would be a very useful um, application for SANS EC with a flexible hybrid. Um, the fuel tank example that we saw for testing, that's also a, a great use of it. Okay, so we are on the hero's journey. There, at a certain point in the hero's journey, um, there is a threshold. And in the Holy Grail, the knights went off to do their own thing. We had COVID. So we had to keep things going through the best methods that we had available to us. Um, we were very lucky because um, Ed and Alex and the crew were uh, very good about making all that uh, function uh, again during some pretty challenging times. And so I um, want to just talk a little bit about some of the tests that we had. We didn't have the Knights of Say Me, but we did, as Alex mentioned, have some uh, minor things come up with the printing ink. Um, we learned that um, the, our first formula was great for electrical conductivity, but RF, maybe not quite as much. Um, we also had to do this matching and mapping of the sensor design uh, to the antenna design. And this is a six axis game of chess because you can see some of the variables on the left, um, as well as the ink as a variable, um, plus the three frequency, amplitude, and bandwidth. If you need to make a change in one of those, uh, all of those are affected. There are other factors too, but these are the ones that were the most commonly uh, things that were uh, creating headaches for um, Alex and Roger. Um, along the way, and again, it, a benefit of for us being able to work with NextFlex was some industry collaboration. Another um, uh, group using the Sun CC technology um, did a knowledge trade with us, and their product use case is to detect product tampering, which is perfect uh, for SANS EC and uh, probably a great uh, application for pharmaceuticals. And the, this collaboration was super helpful to both of us. So we had some what we call machine learnings. So we had to solve a big data problem. Um, with onboard devices. This is a situation where there's you know, no cloud available to us. So we reached out to some colleagues and connected with Qualcomm and applied their robotics uh, processor. Um, this is a, a very, very fast processor, but uh, more than just its raw processing ability was the onboard neural accelerator. Um, this is what helped us discern signal from noise. And just as a fun fact, this device um, is four gen generations above what was on the Mars Ingenier Ingenuity uh, rover. Um, if you can imagine a rover running around on Mars with an iPhone 6 brain in it, that's, that's what that looks like. And this was four generations better. So some of our results, we were able to um, create uh, a sensor, um, an antenna with no wires that would allow us to sense the structural health. 
we had super clean traces. Thank you, Alex and Ed, um, which saved a ton of iterations. And I know there was definitely some hard work and, and sweat and tears for that, but um, the, the result was fantastic. Um, we had uh, the key thing that we were looking for was a solid distinction between changes in phenomena. So just for fun, what if you had um, sensors on a turbine engine or sensors on the right on a turbine engine? We kind of think that the sensor on the right could get rid of at least six of those wires on the left. And if you had a couple, three, four of them, you might be able to get rid of uh, most of them. So in summary, uh, these are some of the things that we learned. Um, we learned the importance of having a US-based supply chain, that the ink uh, makeup was very important, and that um, we also learned that going kind of the other direction, using the inks that we did, did require Alex to have to um, do some redevelopment of parameters and uh, a lot of careful thinking and we are grateful for that. Um, the result was that we ended up with a library of um, materials and processes that are gonna be super helpful in the future. Um, and we also uh, have retained the collaborative freedom to develop our own IP with our software knowledge. Um, and what we think is great about this is it's, hopefully it introduces Dodd and Nextflex members to new sensor technology, be just an option beyond piezoelectric. Um, it also opens up the possibility of doing some collaboration, and we want to put it out there. We'd like to partner with other Netflix members on inks, microcontrollers, and RF uh, chipsets. Um, we would like to print a custom uh, flexible hybrid electronic circuit with a microcontroller and the um, VNA functions, that's the network analyzer function, uh, and have that all be combined together. Um, we'd like to find uh, a path to uh, combining the interrogation antenna on the exact same substrate as the SANS EC sensor. Um, and uh, for our um, remote controlling and operational needs, we'd like to print uh, an antenna for the Swarm. Um, they have a low bandwidth IIoT, that's internet, in, uh, um, internet industrial internet. Industrial. Internet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a mouthful there. Um, we'd like, they have this incredible low bandwidth um, constellation and um, we've done some proof of concept with that. We'd like to wrap this all together into a solution that would allow us to um, have a very neat and tidy uh, setup for being able to monitor and uh, operationally manage um, Dodd assets uh, anywhere on the globe. We want to thank California. And we want to thank Cadence. Um, this was amazing. And the level of support that we received uh, was incredible. And it's definitely something that's going to help us unlock um, innovation. Absolutely want to thank Nextflex. Um, Alex, Ed, bravo, thank you so much. Um, can't say enough about this. Um, and I have to just give a shout out uh, again on the incredibly fine lines you were able to create, uh, the traces. That was fantastic. I have to thank NASA. And we wouldn't have SANS EC uh, use without them. Gyra Systems, this is the group who was gracious enough to work with us on RF and antenna um, improvements and a little bit of machine learning, and we were able to help them with some software, so thanks to them. Thanks to Panasonic, um, they graciously had allowed us to use a new substrate, and that, um, that that was a great result, and thanks also to Alex for taking that on. That was a little above and beyond the call to be able to test that new substrate, so we appreciate you supporting that extra workload. Um, are we doing wearables? No. <laughs> um, we don't have time for that. Um, and we have to thank Dodd for inspiring us to join on this uh, journey. So we just want to say, um, if it's not clear, um, members uh, and, and colleagues, if you're looking to collaborate, so are we. Um, we definitely want to work on embedded software things al uh, and algorithms that are going to help support wearables. Um, 
And if we can get this to microgravity, we'd like to bring our knowledge to help support that and continue that research. Please find us at sierraturbines.com. And back to you, Ed. Well, thanks, Daniel. I really appreciate that. Um, now we're going into the question and answer session. Um, and uh, we, we do already have one question posted, and this is directed to Roger and Daniel. And the question is, can you provide a point of contact in NASA's Convergent Aeronautics Solution, or CAS team, to discuss our in-space manufacturing project? And that's from coming from Kevin Engelbert. Yes. Um... I can provide that contact offline. I, I believe I know how to get hold of Kevin. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Are there any other questions? We only have one. So we have another one uh, from Joe Marie Diamond. And uh, Joe, would you like to ask your question or would you like me to read it? I will read it, and um, that's, can you tell us about the DOD grant-funded interns you assessed um, or accessed that supported your defense business development? And, um, and that's... <laughs> that one, to Ed. <laughs> um, it, it, well, it's... Uh, I don't know if, uh, if that was directed to anybody in particular. Um, okay. My question is, did you guys use any interns? Pardon? I think they might be speaking about the workforce um, program that you have. I... Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I believe that through Chuck Eason, you were able to get some interns that helped you with some things. In, the, in past work that you've been doing? Maybe for cybersecurity? Um, I, 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 honestly, I, I, I don't, um, I'm not personally aware of that, Mary Jo, uh, Jo Marie, but um, I will no, I I meant, research I meant that. Sierra Tur I meant Sierra Turbines, not you. Oh, okay. Um, did you, it, did you have wrong. interns through Chuck Easton, um, Roger, or, or Daniel? Or was it some other, some other help? I think that might have been with the last webinar. Right, yeah. No, so Sierra Turbines is a startup. Uh, we, we don't have interns yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry for jumping the gun. I, I kind of got the idea that you've gotten some help from that. So, okay, we're, we're ready when you are. Okay, the next one uh, comes from Carl Edwards uh, from Gyra Systems, who's, who's no, uh, no stranger to NextFlex, by the way. Um, comment was, thank you for the mention in your presentation, um, Carl. Thank you, Carl. It was, it was a pleasure to work with Gyra, especially, you know, Gyra Systems is an expert on RF and, and you know, yeah. the, the SANS AC sensor, you know, is, is, is a design lesson in RF. And, and so Gyra Systems was very instrumental <laughs> in, in helping us on the RF designs. Because, you know, adapting so, it traditional manufacturing to San DC, uh, you know, we kind of glossed over a little bit. A part of it was on, on, on Netflix side, being able to print it, but part of it was actually on, on you know, tweaking the, the RF antenna design to adapt it to the FHE technology. So, so yeah, thank, I, thank I you, Roger and Daniel. So I have a couple, a couple of questions sure. that that I'd like to submit. Um, could you explain a little bit about um, maybe um, one of the first applications that you have for this um, SANS EC product and specifically what kind of structural health uh, data are you looking for? And I'm assuming it's going to be on your turbines. Correct. Um, you know, one, one of the consumables in any kind of uh, gas turbine applications are the thermal couples, all right? And so as a very basic, I mean, you saw those two images side by side of, you know, a turbine with traditional 
um, thermocouples and sensors. Yes, they end up taking off a bunch of them, but we we are actually replacing thermocouples um, with sans EC sensors. And you know, as a I mean, sans EC can sense up to several phenomena. So it can actually sense temperature and pressures. Um, you know, we, we want to put it on rotational components. And so one single sans EC sensor, because it's measuring amplitude, um, uh, phase shifts, and, and bandwidth, you know, how many resonant frequencies, um, you know, we, we'd love to replace every single sensor with a sans EC sensor. But for now, as we are bringing up our engine, we're just basically replacing all of the thermocouples. Um, because you know th those are the things that burn out eventually, and so you know when we say material science, um, you know we we are using ceramic matrix composites with some of the substrates, and that's where we're going. And you know some of these inks can actually be a lot you know um, higher temperature. I mean these inks we didn't really talk about, but you know these as we mentioned these inks are better suited for RF than they were printed circuit boards. And, you know, in particular, you know, one of the reasons we chose the Panasonic material, you know, is it was a non-silicon based um, substrate and it could withstand 300 degrees Celsius. I mean, not that you'd have a wearable device at 300 degrees Celsius. So, so yeah, we, we're looking to replace multiple sensors and the first application is our thermocouples. Um, and then secondarily, um, there was an interest in using the Enscript platform why is that? So, I mean, we did spend, you know, we did belabor the fact, you know, that yes, we have been involved in a NASA funded uh, cyber, you know, with, with Redwire since 2018. And so we do have, you know, we've been around that ecosystem for, for several years now. Um, you, you know, one of the abilities to transition this onto ISS resources, you know, there there is basically an end script in microgravity. Um, you know what we have learned on the material science improvements th this that was um, a program for in space manufacturing for a terrestrial application you know this would be more of a the line because as i said the the iss version of nscript uh, could be in space manufacturing for in space applications so as you could see you know you could have one sensor um, that you know could be utilized in different applications um you know the the inflatable habitat i mean that was sat in, nasa langley and dr woodward had actually done some research at, at the white sands high velocity uh facility to simulate you know orbital debris hitting you know an inflatable habitat and so yeah we we you know we were peripherally involved in in space manufacturing and the fact that this technology and these materials could potentially be transferred, you know, onto, you know, the, the, the equivalent printer on the ISS is called the BFF, you know, and so the, this technology and this effort could actually transfer over to the ISS. And so that was kind of one of the reasons we did, you know, uh, I mean, NetSex has got an incredible amount of technology. Again, thank you. But you know, we, we could have printed this sensor with other technologies, but we chose the Enscript because there's a quote Enscript, you know, orbiting Earth right now. Okay, we have another uh, posted question from Grant Watchtel. Um, and the question is, you mentioned that it was a trial in RF design. What are some of the challenges with designing these sensors for specific RF performances? Were materials a larger challenge or the geometries? <laughs> Perfect. So, and this is where gyro was instrumental. So, antenna Q factor. Um, you know, Alex could probably talk about the, you know, the skin depth, the layering, doing this, you know, with the end script. So, yes, the tray size. Um, you know, the, the, like you said, it's one continuous line, right? So it's not start stopping. And so, um, yeah, so part of it was really on the inks and, and, and the skin depth and the, you know, the, the thickness of the inks, which really, really does um, affect the, the, you know, the, the Q factor of an antenna. 
I, mean, I think we have, Daniel, if you're able to go back to that slide where we actually have the image of the, the RF response. Uh, I want to talk about that quickly. <laughs> you know, no, the, the actual waveform patterns with the, with the, actually, if you can just. And so what you're seeing there, those nice curves, those, you know, um, there, there was a lot of work you know, Alex could probably tell you the work that it took to get those kind of nice, clean, you know, responses. And and yes, it was a combination of of you know really focusing on the inks and the skin depth to get a, a very good antenna Q factor. Yeah. And so I do think, we uh, have any more? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to add a little bit of uh, more comments on that. And I think like what Roger was mentioning is that there definitely is some, you know, I can't speak too much of the RF challenges, but from the material standpoint, one of the immediate things that we were seeing is that uh, while the, these sensors appear to be relatively resilient to uh, lower than copper resistances, to put it nicely, um, there is certainly a threshold where you have to pass to be able to detect it. Uh, and that's what we meant, found with one of our earlier ink trials. We were looking at a uh, very stretchable ink, uh, specifically geared towards the Baolex material, uh, but it was a little bit lower resistance as a um, factor. The other materials challenge, of course, is really in the printing and maintaining uh, very fine lines, uh, relatively high thickness uh, over a large area. Um, like Roger was alluding to, skin depth uh, in these frequency ranges. Uh, I don't think we have it on the chart, but it, we're, we were measuring in the hundreds of megahertz range uh, becomes kind of an issue. So, um, you know, there's a lot of little details that go into it. And uh, we were trying to uh, really see what we could uh, see, I think, with this initial study. Um, and hopefully we get to continue this, right? <laughs> so um, also, uh, Daniel and Roger, um, you mentioned in your presentation that um, the grant and, and Nextflex provided you access to um, a technology that was uh, you know, otherwise um, not available. Um, and, uh, and, and what I'd like to ask you to expound upon was the um, the sort of support from a supply chain point of view and from a manufacturing point of view. I know, um, Daniel, you'd, you'd contrasted how long it takes to have something built in China versus space. But can you talk about what, what that difference made during COVID right here in the Silicon Valley? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so look, <laughs> I, I worked for Apple for 19 years. I've been to the factories in China to support, uh, you know, programs. Um, first off, you know, the level of technology within the walls of Netflix, you know, are generally have only generally been available to companies like, you know, Apple and Samsung working on wearables. Um, it, it's even though, you know, this is, as I said, we, we are an industry 4.0 company. We're doing digital manufacturing. Right, additive manufacturing is, is disruptive, and and look, we you know all of those missions to ISS happened in 2020, right? So um, you know you can send the files up, they get printed, you know, then the parts come back down. So you know, a the location of Silicon Valley, you know, the skill sets, right? I mean, Gyra is located in California. It, it we are we were familiar with this technology in you know in in another life, you know, before we did the startup. So we, we understand the technology. It's hyper local, as we say. You know, we, we I've been to the NextX facility. You know, under the COVID guidelines and rules, we were able to kind of, you know, those in-person meetings do help. But in terms of, you know, being local, being in the same time zone, I mean, we this this is I don't think this could have actually happened if you know we were another part of the country. So. Okay, then, um, 
if we don't have any more questions. Hey, Ed, um, I think we, we missed a question from Kevin Engelbert. So I'm going to unmute him. Oh, okay. I, I, I see it. Oh, or, you, or you could read it either way. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, it says, can a SANS EC sensor detect stress, strain in a propagating crack scenario on a pressurized metal shell? So, as, as if you can go back to our, you know, the image of our engine. Um, so obviously it's an antenna. So it would short out if you printed a metal conductive trace on, you know, a metal substrate. And so the, the beauty of FHE, um, it is multi-layer. So you have a dielectric here. So, so in this photo here, we have a SANS EC printed on a metal structure. We haven't done a lot of testing, obviously, the RF response is, you know, is, is not going to be ideal. Um, the the beauty about SANS EC and the beauty about FHE is you can print that dielectric layer, and and that's when you can get into layering, and and so yes, it can be tailored. Um, we you know we haven't tested that, but what you're seeing here is an early possibility of that, and and what you're seeing this particular material. Um, this is actually Haynes 282. So this is that what the rocket guys are actually using to print rocket engines today. So it, it's you, you wouldn't print metal on metal. It would short the antenna out. Well, I, I think what they were look what he's looking for was the capabilities of of um, the San DC sensor. Um, Wonder again if it if it if it can be used to to um, detect the propagating crack and the stress and strain that it puts on that um, pressurized um, shell. And, and actually, yeah, so we didn't, we didn't feature it in Dr. Woodward's with you. Um, so NASA Langley and Dr. Woodward did actually show it detecting and it's still working at a, at a hyper velocity speed. So it saw the crack and it continues to resonate so yes, and and you know because of the way how so so two things what SANS EC makes up for in its simplicity, <laughs> you know on the back end the software processing, um, you know is required to really detect it. And so because with when something is cracking or or, or you know you will see a shift in those frequencies, um, and so yes it it will still operate it when it's damaged and cracked and you can detect it by by you know the operational shift in frequency and and you know there's a very good video I'll, I'll be happy to send it to kevin there's a very good video where they showed uh you know equivalent of a, uh orbital habitat where the sensor was was completely ripped but they were still able to get a response out of it so and, and that's that that's where our team really comes into play in terms of we this is a level of software that we're used to write in our entire careers um, and so that's where I, I will say, so SANS EC, is, this is a perfect technology. And I think, you know, Dr. Woodward back in the day, I mean, I think he developed this right around the time of the TWA center tank explosion, but he had envisioned machine learning and AI as, you know, as a thing in the future that you might actually be able to then combine. And then, and that's really what he said, this, this whole effort great technology at netflix that's never been able you know for been available to a startup great software and very good you know embedded compute processing capability so you, you know this, this is an area where um like we said we we're happy to collaborate on because you know the algorithms uh to detect you know, hyper velocities, A, how would you even test them? And what might that even look like in terms of frequency shifts? But it is absolutely possible. In the video, just to to your to your point, um, so it took only one sensor out of an uh, of an array of sensors that were uh, essentially made into um, a, a, a layer. Um, it took only one sensor to detect the damage and the sensor that had been damaged um, was still functional. So um, if what you're hoping to detect is a stress crack, um, that uh, there would be a change in phenomena that, that would likely be detectable. Uh, 
Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Daniel. Um, if we don't have any more questions, um, we could end this at uh, end this uh, give you an, another 15 minutes of your life back. Um, so I, I want to thank everybody um, for attending. Um, but before I go, I wanted to plug um, uh, get you aware of some of the other uh, Cadence projects. These are projects that are um, done by other Cadence um, uh, participants. And uh, you'll see us on number three there. Um, but many of the, uh, many of the projects are uh, security and workforce development related. Um, please go to the next slide. And there are a total of 15 projects and there are some of the, the different organizations. If you'd like to learn more about them, you can contact me um, and I can set you to the right point of contact um, within the Keynes program. And again, thank you all for attending this webinar on the Keynes program and the NextFlex support to see our turbines. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.